Ramya, I want to thank you so much for coming on the podcast today and being willing to share a little bit more about your story. I understand you grew up uh, in a Hindu household, and I'm kind of wondering how that plays a part in your story. Yeah, absolutely. Honestly, outside of like family dysfunction, which I think most families have, it was a pretty normal upbringing. Um, my family you know, took time to pray at the temple, usually on Saturdays. But my dad did come to America when I was three. And my mom and I moved in with my grandparents. So they were kind of the spiritual leaders of our house. And spirituality for me was waking up and going to the temple inside of our house and praying before school, go to school, come back, have a normal, you know, just like do my homework, eat a snack, like, have dinner with my family. And then before bed, we were expected to pray not to go to the temple or anything. Um, but gen generally speaking, I wasn't big into those Hindu gods or anything like that. Usually my bedtime prayer, which was for myself, I would just pray to God. Like um, English wasn't a second language for me. I learned at the same time as my native tongue. So I mean, I, I think in English, I, for as long as I can remember, it's been like that. So I prayed, I used the word G-O-D. And when I used that word, I was addressing like a sovereign God, like the head honcho above all other gods. And that was just kind of how I understood it as a three-year-old and a four-year-old and a five-year-old and just kind of onward for quite some time. I did go to Catholic school while I was in India, so... I had learned the Lord's Prayer at a young age. And so I do believe that we said it on campus um, before we entered the classroom. So I'm sure that had something to do with it. And there were times that I would go to the chapel at my school and pray to Jesus there um, in the chapel. And my grandparents never looked down on me for that. And my grandpa also made it a point to take me to um church on Christmas and he would tell me okay these are the Christians this is their God this is what they do we're still we still love them and we still honor them but it's important for you to understand other faiths as well so that is pretty atypical I would say for a Hindu household I just had a really amazing grandfather um that did that for me what would you say is a more typical sort of attitude in a Hindu household? Sorry, just out of curiosity. Um, I, you know what? There is no central doctrine really in Hinduism. Um, I would say most people follow the Bhagavad Gita, um, which I have read. I actually read it in college because it was a sign for my theology class I was taking. Um, I hadn't read it until then, but, um, most families have like a patron deity and they pray to that deity and each one of those deities have like a a day of the week like assigned to them when the family will like do a puja and like the higher up on the caste system that you are the more involved you are in going to the temples and doing the pujas and things like that I would say my family's probably somewhere in the middle of the road in terms of like devotion and piety, not overly religious, but not under religious either. Um, and I would say that it is very different than going to a church service because when you go to a temple, you're not sitting in for a service. It's more like you might just go pray to the idols and leave you might approach the priest and you might need a special type of ritual or blessing and that's all like all the families just kind of do that on their own and each family has their own tradition and it varies like state to state and city to city india is very diverse there's at least 23 languages there's tons of states i think there's like 20 something states so there's a huge mixing and mashing of different types of culture and even the Muslims and the Christians and the Catholics that live in India and the Zoroastrians and the Jains they're heavily influenced by this Hindu culture um and as you know we have territorial spirits obviously that's a land that's very much controlled by 
the marine kingdom or Hindu Hindu gods, like whatever you want to call it. They're both the same. Um, so yeah, I hope that gives a greater insight. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. We actually had some neighbors uh, of mine across the road who were Hindu and they would always say like, you can come pray with us. Like we have Jesus there too, you know? So they were very inclusive and actually quite open to us participating in their faith life, which was really interesting yeah. growing up. Um, I'm wondering, did your Hindu background sort of introduce you into the uh, occult practices you were later involved in? What was your introduction to witchcraft like for you? Um, No, I actually, I would say my interest in the occult probably started when the Harry Potter books came out. Um, and just as a little girl, I knew there's no way that humans can imagine this stuff up on their own. Like there has to be some kind of fundamental truth or um, evidence of this. Like how can people just kind of conjure this up in their head? You know, humans are not that creative in my opinion. And so I started doing a little bit of research. I was very much a bookworm, very studious as a child. And I love checking out books at the library. I love fiction and I love nonfiction. So obviously now I'm going towards the nonfiction section and there's all these books in the library, just freely available on witchcraft and Wicca and ritual and runes and divination and all the Greek mythology books are freely available. It's just, it's just there. And my parents were like, oh my gosh, look at our daughter. She's reading so much. Um, and my sister was also born when I was nine and a half, almost 10. So we have a big age gap. So I did experience this time where I was left kind of unattended um, and a lot of attention was on her because of course she's the baby, right? She's a newborn child. So this was the time where it was easy for my parents to take me to the library, check out all my books and I just like sit in my room and read all day. Um, that's why I say, I tell, I tell parents like you've got to be mindful of what your kids are reading. You know, not all books are good. Um, and there's far more heinous things available free freely for children in um, school libraries now. So that was my introduction to the occult. There was this book, it was called, um, it was by Scott Cunningham. Um, and he is an authority in the Wiccan religion, a form of witchcraft, very earth-based spirituality. And, um, and then there was also like turmoil in the home too. And it was called the solitary practitioner's guide to Wicca. I think that's what it was called. And I started with simple visualizations of, um, protection and understanding what different like tools were used in ritual and understanding basic runes, how they can like mark the seasons. And I just got this like rudimentary understanding and this path continued all the way through middle school. And then, um, and then when I was 13, I entered high school and then I just couldn't care less about spirituality by that point. At that point, I was just full on like, I got to do really well in school. I got to get into the best colleges and like my shift, my focus shifted to academia. And, um, yeah, like I, at that point there was so much turmoil going on in my home that I was like, there's no way that God is real. Like there's no way God has, has not lifted a finger to help my family with these things or help me deal with these situations. There's no peace in our home. There's no joy in our home. Our home is very broken. Like, so I couldn't care less. I didn't care if it was a Hindu God, Christian God, pagan God, whatever. So I was just over it. And then I just put all my, you know, I just fired on all cylinders with school, focused on enjoying, you know, good relationships with my friends and, and then onward. And then, you know, I have obviously like my testimony of how I came to Jesus on my ministry, Beach Bunny Ministries. But then I did have a story where I backpedaled into 
the occult, but this time I went full throttle exploring and experimenting in witchcraft for about four years and it nearly ruined my life. I mean, I'm still rebuilding and it's been, gosh, like a decade. Um, so that's kind of like the flow um, and the exposure and involvement into the occult. And that doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the Hinduism. Although it was really nice to mix and match all the different doctrines. Um, you know, when you start looking at Jesus as like an ascended master, just like as another person that's walked the earth that you can learn from, and you reduce all the other little G demon gods to other ascended masters, it puts them all on like the same thing. And you can kind of just like cherry pick what you want. And that's usually the religion that most people are in. People don't want to hear this, especially the Christian world, but the largest religion in the world is witchcraft. And that's because many Christians are in new age practices or occult practices of witchcraft, and they don't even know it. It's not intentional. Um, and it, these little things, they trickle down even into like a gift shop, like they'll have an intention candle. Well, that's a spell. Words are spells. That's why it's called spelling. Um, and so it's very pervasive all through the world. Um, but the Hindu background, I would just say, was kind of minimal um, in my shaping and making, if that makes sense. Yeah, that makes total sense. So you're going through a lot. Uh, I want to firstly say thanks for your vulnerability and sharing that you were going through a difficult time at that period in your life. And it seems all yeah. of your attention shifts sort of towards <laughs> academia. When does that change, right? Because I know you're trying to get into med school. You're obviously pretty firmly yeah. planted within a secular worldview. When does that begin to change for you? Yeah. Um, well, I've always been this charitable kind of person. I've always had a heart for other people. Like in high school, if I ever saw a girl sitting by herself at the lunchroom, I'm going to go up and invite her to sit with me. So I, I was always this good person. But as we know, like good works are like filthy rags before God. And so I was very focused on being like a stand-up student and like doing all my charity stuff, but I didn't understand why I couldn't win over any level of like divine hell. I was tired. I was tired of doing everything on my own. I was tired of getting good grades, but still not getting the outcome that I wanted, which was to get into medical school. I was tired of doing all this and that and just you know, in my opinion, I wasn't like a bad kid. Like I wasn't doing anything that would give me bad karma because I was still thinking along those lines and stuff. But really, um, my breaking point was when I wanted to know that I wasn't alone. I didn't care about heaven. I didn't care about hell. I didn't care about reincarnation. I didn't care about any of that. I just wanted to know that I wasn't alone and that I had help that there was something or someone that loved me and cared for me that wasn't my parents, um, that wasn't my family, and it wasn't my friends, somebody that could literally fix my life if they wanted to. Um, and it was that vulnerability, that point that I had to get to, that had me become open to Jesus. Because on top of everything else, I was not treated very well by Christians. Um, my first boyfriend was very abusive, emotionally abusive to me, and he was um, very manipulative. I actually believe that he he must have had like borderline personality disorder. And he was my first boyfriend, you know, like that really messes you up. And I was only 17 and he was Christian on a Christian scholarship and he dragged me to church with him every weekend because he told me if it makes me look good if you show up and I'm like okay fine so I would go and I and I hated it I hated how fake he was I hated that he was a liar and that this was supposed to be the example of like Christian um but then I had a very loving relationship um in the remainder of my college years and this man was a man of God. He was a godly man through and through. He prayed for me. He treated me right. And then he actually became the standard of what I would accept in my later years as an adult of what I would accept in a relationship because he treated me so well. Um, 
And I truly believe that I got saved because of his prayers and his grandparents' prayers for me. They were Pentecostal preachers. While his family, again, still treated me with a level of ugliness, the way his grandparents loved on me changed me. Like it, I felt that love of Jesus um, through them. And um, I basically had fast forward to um, being waitlisted at med schools. I had an anxiety attack. I've only ever had one and it was this one. And I thought I was dying. Um, and I approached this girl it, who went to the med school that I was a grad student at. And her name is appropriately named Mary. And um, I was like, yo, I don't know where you have all this piece, but I want some of it. <laughs> it's kind of what I told her. I said, you know, I'm doing all the right things. I'm, um, you know, I pray, like I pray for God to get me into med school. Like I've done everything right. I got my great MCAT score. I got my accolades, achievements. I got all that. Isn't that when God steps in and does what I can't do as a human? Like I don't have power as a human. And she told me the story um, of how she thought she failed an exam and then she prayed and Jesus told her that she got her an 86 and lo and behold, she got an 86. And I was like, okay, it sounds kind of crazy, but the worst thing that could happen is like nothing. I've been praying for years and nothing's ever happened my whole life. And she was like, my secret is Jesus. Like, um, I can just give you a booklet. Um, you can read it on your own. You can just tell me how you feel about it. We can get together, have coffee. We can just talk about it. There's no pressure here. And, um, she handed me this booklet and it was called knowing Jesus Christ as Lord. And I have it here somewhere in my apartment. Um, and I read through it and, I don't know. There was some story. I barely remember the story. Um, I had just gotten back from the gym and um, I didn't want to pray the prayer because in my eyes, like I was dirty from the gym. And one of the Hindu practices that I learned is like, you should never be dirty in the house of God. And so I um, thought I needed to shower before I was worthy of praying a prayer. But something just like pushed me to just start reading it. And the next thing I knew, I was reading it out loud. And this overwhelming presence just took over the room. It just took over the room. It was just so tangible. And to this day, I will still tell you that it was the most real presence that I've ever felt in my life. It was warm. It was loving. I knew I was in the palm of God's hand. I was sobbing. And for the first time, I was exposed to what I believe is holiness. I had never seen holiness. I have never had to be in reverence um, my whole life. And that's that's the key distinction. You know, in these other faiths, there's no, there's no holiness there. There's no life there. And I had never felt that before. I had never felt that in a temple or anything like that. And that's how I knew, okay, you're in the presence of the real God. And your whole life is going to change. So that's how the conversion happened for me. And then, um, and then I think, you know, the story of how I got into med school and heard the voice of God and everything. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Could you share a little bit about that for our audience that might not be familiar with this story? <laughs> yeah, um, it's a wild story. And um, Let's see. I was waitlisted. I was rejected from one school, waitlisted at two, and I was so desperate to get in. Um, long story short, I had gone through another breakup, and this was my last ever um, long-term relationship. Um, so this was 11 years ago, dating back quite some years. And um, anyway, I moved some of my stuff back into my own apartment. He lived in my neighborhood. So I had a lot of my stuff at his place too. So I had moved all my stuff back in. And then there was this insane like rainstorm. Um, and there was all this wind and much of the power had started to go out in the city. And I was scared because now I'm alone in my apartment, my phone battery's dying. And I, I just feel scared, you know, and um, I felt like God was calling me to just drive home. Um, and I, I knew, I knew I had the next day off because I had told the doctor that I got 
that I was um, doing research for, I told her, I was like, hey, Dr. Hernandez, I got done. She was like, okay, go home, <laughs> like take the day off, like just go home. I was like, okay, it was almost the weekend. So I got in my car and I was driving to my parents' house and I was asking the Lord, okay, so what about this med school thing? I've only ever asked you for two things. And it was like to help me become a doctor and to have like a wonderful husband one day. Like, these are the two things that I need from you. And that's all I need. <laughs> <laughs> I've had to eat my own words, but, um, so I was driving and the Lord's prayer came up in my spirit and, and I realized my heavenly father um, won't forgive me if I don't forgive other people for their sins against me. And I recalled my first relationship and, um, I left, I had left the guy completely hanging. Like I transferred schools, changed my number, completely disappeared and held a little bit of a grudge against him. I didn't really feel like closure was needed. Um, considering all that had happened, um, but I knew he was somebody that I had to forgive. So I was like, okay, God, I would love to call him and forgive him. Happy to forgive him, but I don't have his number. And um, his phone number as clear as day. I mean, I still know the number, which is wild as, as clear as day pops up into my head. And I was like, here goes nothing. Here goes nothing. Um, and I dialed that number and it was him. And he was like, wow, I never thought I'd hear from you again. He's like, I'm actually having dinner with my fiance right now. She knows all about you and like our story and everything. And I'm like, yeah, well, I just want to, you know, I gave my life to Jesus and this is the Christian guy. Right. And, um, and I just want to let you know, I forgive you. And unfortunately him and his then fiance took it as an opportunity to like harass me and trouble me like for years on end. That's a whole nother story. But I did, I still did the thing God asked me to do, which was to forgive. And so I did went home sitting on this twin size mattress on my, in my um, childhood home, I would say. And I was like, okay, God, I've done what you've asked now what about med school? And I hear a voice like thunder, like immediately, like my eyes snap up to the ceiling because it's so loud. And there's so much authority in this voice too. And I hear him say, July 16th, do not doubt. This is all happening um, on July 6th of 2012. And he gives me the date of July 16th. And he says, do not doubt. So I've got 10 days. And I was like, oh my God, I think I just heard the voice of God, Old Testament style. And I ran into my mom's room and I said, mom, I don't want you to worry about my future or like what's ahead for me because I'm going to get into med school this year and you're not going to have to worry about a thing ever again. And she just stared at me. And I was like, okay, I'm going back to my room. And I went back to my room. And then I headed back up north um, I, where I was living. The city I was going to school in was like four hours away from my parents. So I headed back home. Um, and July 16th rolls around. Now I'm cowering in my bed, like hiding under my sheets because it's July 16th and I'm chicken. And... <laughs> And I hear now this like really gentle voice. It's like eight something in the morning. And it says to me, um, pull up your laptop, pull up, pull up your Gmail account and wait. 8.33 a.m. July 16th of 2012. I have this email from one of the med school say we had one person drop out of the class. Are you still interested in coming here? classes start July 26th again another 10 days and I was like oh my god like I just got into med school um freaking out and I had to figure out this crazy move and find an apartment very last minute and everything but that was yeah that's how I heard the voice of the Lord for the first time in my life and he came to me with prophecy and as always he's accurate he doesn't miss the mark but it also 
you know, vested on me not having doubt, right? So you still have to be obedient. You still have to be obedient to the conditions of the prophecies that he gives you. Um, so yeah, that's kind of the story. That's incredible. Yeah. And at one point there's some backsliding, right? That occurs in your life. Mm -hmm. Was that prior to this? And, and what did that look like? Because I'm still trying to understand how you go from um, a really secular worldview to sort of practicing witchcraft and then coming to Christ. Yeah. Can you help flesh that out a little bit? Yeah. So unfortunately, after I gave my life to the Lord, I found myself in the self-help section quite a bit and I had major life changes. So I exper experienced getting into medical school and um, hearing the voice of God, this miracle, only two months after getting saved. I gave my life to the Lord May 10th of 2012. And then the timeline of getting accepted to med school was July of 2012. And then I had to move states away, away from all my infrastructure, away from all my friends, make new friends all over again. And then medical school is really, really, really hard. So I um, had to move really, really far away. And I also got into the practice of yoga as a Christian. And this is so silly to me because when I first came into the Lord, I got hit with this like wave of like just lightness, this energy. And I was on this momentum of energy that I got and my self-improvement journey kind of took over. I'm like, okay, I got to get back in shape. I got to start exercising every day. Um, and I mean, I was already exercising every day, but I decided to add in yoga to it because I watched Oprah's Super Soul Sunday and Deepak Chopra and Oprah, and she's Christian, he's Hindu. I was like, hmm, maybe like they're actually kind of compatible. I don't know. I had not gone to church before. I had never sat through a Bible study. I did start reading the Bible. I actually started with Genesis and I started reading the gospels, but I was so new, you know, I had like no foundation. I was pretty much the seed that was sh sowed on very shallow ground and the roots just never developed. And so I withered away. So that's kind of see how I see it myself. Honestly, to an extent, I would probably call myself a false convert because Within a month of getting saved, I was already in self-help books, yoga, and then next thing I knew, um, I'm exposing myself to law of attraction type stuff. But I, at that time, I didn't realize it was incompatible with Christianity. I also never really believed in Satan. I didn't, I knew demons were real because in Hinduism, demons absolutely exist. But I didn't believe in a devil. I didn't believe in this enemy personality. I just assumed it was my ego that needed taming and trainings. You know, you have to also realize that I was filled to the brim with, you know, a lot of philosophical studies and just esoteric crap my whole life. And I'm very detail oriented. And I'm always trying to put this puzzle of life together so while I was in med school, um, again, I just started going through some really hard times. I now understand it was spiritual warfare and I had two choices. One was to wisen up and walk with God. And the other was to start getting away into new age level Christianity and spirituality, which is where I ended up. The harder school got the more away from Christianity I would go. I also continued to have poor experiences with Christians. I felt like they were so judgmental of my background. They had never met a Hindu to Christian convert and they just treated me like I was some alien. And I don't like that. I didn't think that was loving. I didn't think that was kind. And then the church that I was trying to go to didn't really emphasize the Old Testament at all. Um, I was under the impression that the Old Testament's for the Jews and then the New Testament's for the Christians. So again, no sound doctrine, but at the same time, there's nobody helping me. You know, I, it's not like I have somebody to just call, like I don't have a Christian friend to call and talk to me about all this. Mary had kind of just disappeared out of my life. Um, and 
So I was really alone, tr just trying to navigate the best I could. But I knew that I was so good at manifesting and attracting results. That's the path that seemed to yield results, even though I wanted to have the kind of results like I had with the miracles of the Lord. But God is sovereign, right? We can't strong arm him into anything. But I was just obsessed with putting out my intentions and getting my results, put, doing my meditation and getting my results. And I wasn't getting that with Jesus. And I wasn't picking up the Bible and delving in deep, even though I tried to, I would just get this like block. And I think it also went as far as like, God took away my spiritual gifts in that time because I was abusing them. I was using them for divination, even though I knew I had the gift of prophecy, even though I knew, um, you know, I was watching my dreams um, often come to pass um, in my everyday life. And this is something that I actually experienced my whole life. I didn't really cover it, um, but it kicked up a notch um, when I became Christian and I didn't really know how to handle that. And I tried to get counsel through the church. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening. I had this dream and it came true next day. And I don't know what's wrong with me. And it just wasn't received well. Um, and yeah, it, that's kind of how I ended up in the new age and in occult practices for about four years. And uh, I know you've got a headache. I really want to make this quick. So how did how did you get to the <laughs> point where you kind of come out of that? And now you've got your own YouTube channel, you know, you're sharing your testimony on various podcasts. What did it look like for you to leave those practices and then come fully to Christ? In June of 2017, I realized there was no life in those practices. Everything that I was manifesting was just like a temporary band-aid to permanent problems. And I realized there was, again, there was no life and there was no love. These deities, um, the ones that I was working with, they would just take, 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 and they never gave in return. Whereas Jesus asked me for nothing other than to love him back and walk in relationship with him. Like I felt the softness of Christ's heart and how different it was than everything else. So in June, I said to the Lord, okay, God, I want to give all of this up. I want to walk straight and narrow with you. And I will disband anything in my life that you tell me is unworthy and unclean. I made that decision in June, 2017. And in July, 2017, I went through another circumstance in my life, another major trauma that just kind of turned my life upside down, inside out. God gave me a complete and total book of Job experience where he just wiped that plate clean for me. Um, and I'm still, you know, I'm still rebuilding. Um, I also knew that my story was unique and that God was going to call me to a public platform one day. When I turned back towards him, I started helping out other online ministries. And that's where the moniker Beach Bunny came from, because I was trying to be anonymous and I didn't want my face associated with any. I was already dealing with enough spiritual warfare as it was. Um, my ministry started when he woke me up in December of 2022 and he said to me, daughter, you are doing a disservice to me by not telling the world what I've done for you. And I was like, oh, okay. And I just went on my YouTube and I just immediately changed that name to Beach Bunny to Beach Bunny Ministries because I knew that was going to be my ministry name for years. Um, and <laughs> three hours later, I lost my job um, after starting my ministry. Um, and that's how I knew God was with me. And you'll find that my take on things are very different than the normal popularized um, churchianity teachings. Um, I focus very much on strategy and results. Again, I still have that love, right? 
one of the reasons I went off into the new age is because I, I could employ these strategies and I would get results right away. Well, it turns out you can actually do that with the Bible um, by praying out loud the word of God and understanding that God's not a legalist, but Satan surely is. And if you could take away any legal ground, the enemy's hanging over your head that he's accusing you of in the courts of heaven, you will have incredible breakthrough. And that's really what my ministry is all about. It is going to shift in direction a little bit um, in the future. I've taken a little break from it. I've also had some other life changes. Um, so working around those things and just making the time for it, but it's going to go in a different way. But um, my prayer strategies that I teach yield fabulous results. You'll never meet a person uh, who hasn't already been a character in the Bible. You'll never encounter a problem that hasn't already occurred in the Bible. So if you know the word of God and you can identify the characters you're dealing with, the principalities you're dealing with, and the situations you're dealing with, you can go find them in the word and apply them. You will have your results. And that's what I focus on. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for sharing that. That was very well said. Um, and yeah, I know uh, for those of you who are listening now, Romy actually came on and she had a headache from the start. She's had an incredibly busy <laughs> month and she's persevered and gone on anyway. So I think we'll cut it uh, about here. But thank you for sharing your story. It was really incredible, uh, deeply encouraging to me and I'm sure everybody that's listening. Um, so yeah, please go check out Ramya at Beach Bunny Ministries. I'm going to link that in the description box below so that it's really convenient for you guys to find. Um, if you're listening to us on Spotify, please consider giving us a review. And on YouTube, please like and subscribe. It helps get Ramya's story out to far, far more people. Uh, Ramya, thanks for coming on today. You and I will talk a little bit more after this. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me.